late bloomer. It's a term used to describe people that develop a skill or reach their full potential later in life. In the sporting world, we hear this about all kinds of journeyman players and competitors, but most are really only late bloomers due to the opportunities that they're given. Many have the talent all along, but are never really given the opportunity to prosper. In a sport like NASCAR, this is all too common. Nowadays, if you can't get your foot in the door by the age of 20 and win right away, you're labeled a bust or too old to ever be successful. Today, I'd like to take the time to tell the story of one of our favorite journeyman drivers that was never given a serious opportunity in NASCAR until his late 30s. It's time to tell the tale of Mike Skinner, a strange starter. The journeyman driver from California, the move east, Swept the shop at Richard Petty's, had a couple of pickup rides, started a few Winston Cup races, took a long time for him to get his career on track. He rented some equipment from Richard Childress. Childress kept an eye on him, liked what he saw, named Skinner to drive his super truck, and as he takes the checkered flag, Mike Skinner is the first super truck by Craftsman Series champion, wins the battle and the war. Ernie Irvin comes home a couple of tenths of a second behind. Mike Skinner grew up in Susanville, California, and like most young drivers, he grew up racing on his local short track, Susanville Speedway. He raced both dirt and asphalt throughout his teens until he finally made the decision that many drivers of the time did. He decided to move to North Carolina to pursue a career in NASCAR. But racing driver jobs don't really grow on trees, so he took various crew member roles with race teams. His first gig was with Richard Petty's team working with engine builder Terry Elledge. He later worked for Cliff Stewart and served as a tire changer on Rusty Wallace's car. The team even won the 1984 Pit Crew Championship. But Mike didn't stay as a crew member for very long. While he was good at it and enjoyed it, he was concerned that he'd be pigeonholed into always being a crew member or a mechanic his whole career. He decided to leave his crew jobs and focus on racing at short tracks throughout North Carolina. Mike was able to turn some heads in those days, and he did put a deal together to drive for Zanworth Racing in 1986 in a few cup races. He made his debut at Martinsville, finishing 22nd. He made two other starts that year, but he never bettered that 22nd place finish in his debut. Mike didn't return to cup racing until 1990, but he did make a few cup starts every year between 1990 and 1994, driving for team owners Thee Dixon and Jimmy Means. In fact, Jimmy Means has given a lot of our strange starters rides over the years. Jimmy Means. He's a friend of the strange starter. In 1994, he also put a deal together with Gene Petty Motorsports to do some racing in the Bush series with backing from the Colonel. That's right, KFC folks, Kentucky Fried Chicken on the side of Mike Skinner's car, a huge sponsor for the small team. Mike qualified for five of the seven races, including winning the pole at Charlotte. Unfortunately, the team failed to finish any of the five races they competed in due to crashes or mechanical failures, so you could almost say that it was anything but finger looking good. Now, Mike didn't have the finishes and things were looking down for him, but he had proven, especially with his pole at Charlotte, that he could drive, and that's something that didn't slip past Cup Series owner Richard Childress. Now, I mentioned earlier that NASCAR driving jobs don't just grow on trees. There's only so many seats to go around. But in 1994, a whole bunch more seats were set to open. Bad-ass truck seats, that is. For the 1995 season, NASCAR was set to debut the brand new Super Truck Series. This was to be the first incarnation of what you know today as the Camping World Truck Series. Teams like Hendrick Motorsports, Roush Racing, Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, and of course Richard Childress Racing all committed to running teams in the series, and these teams would need drivers. Rather than go out and hire a whole bunch of hotshot young gun drivers, most of these teams opted to sign older veteran drivers from around the country. This gave several overlooked drivers that had never gotten a real shot at NASCAR a golden opportunity to make a name for themselves and move up to the highest levels of NASCAR. Mike Skinner was tabbed by Richard Childress Racing to drive the number 3 GM Goodrich truck in 1995, and he made a splash immediately by winning the pole for the first winter heat race, which was an exhibition run in late 1994. He won the final winter heat race in January of 1995 and carried that momentum into the season opener at Phoenix. 
Mike rolled off 16th for the race, but worked his way through the field and had an incredible battle with Terry Labonte in the closing laps of the race. In fact, he almost lost it coming off turn four, taking the checkered flag, but he held off Terry Labonte and won the inaugural Super Truck Series race. Mike's success in that first race was a sure sign of things to come. He and the number three team went on a tear. They won eight races, had 10 pole positions, and 17 top five finishes in the 20 races for an overall average finish of fifth. He would earn the inaugural Super Trucks Championship by 126 points over Joe Ruttman. At age 38, Mike had just won his first NASCAR championship, and he was well on his way to the highest level of the sport. Mike returned to RCR's number three truck in 1996, winning another eight races and earning another 17 top five finishes, but he lost out on the championship by 60 points to rival Ron Hornaday Jr who was driving a truck owned by his future Cup Series teammate. Speaking of the Cup Series, RCR announced that Mike would be moving up to the Cup Series full-time in 1997. He ran five races in RCR's number 31 Chevy in 1996 to prep him for the opportunity. He qualified strong for all six races and had a best finish of 12th at Rockingham. So even at age 39, it looked like Mike was going to be a formidable driver in the Cup Series. In 1997, Richard Childress Racing would expand to two full-time cup entries for the first time in the team's history. Mike Skinner would drive the new number 31 Lowe's Chevy. And before we continue, I just need to take a moment to explain that this is the only Lowe's paint scheme for me. I'm sorry, Jimmy Johnson. I know that you had a lot of great Lowe's paint schemes, but this is my favorite one. I love it. The yellow and everything. The fact that no one's done a throwback to it, it's criminal. People should be in prison because this has not been a throwback yet. So somebody uh, put some respect on Mike Skinner and do a throwback to this because this paint scheme is amazing. That's the only Lowe's paint scheme for me. The expansion to a second car was great for Mike. He got to move up to the Cup Series and he got to have a seven-time NASCAR champion as a teammate to learn from. But Dale Earnhardt didn't see it this way at first. He wasn't interested in having a teammate or helping anyone learn how to beat him. Now I know what you're thinking, I'm making Dale Earnhardt out to be a bad guy, and I would never do that, but it's kind of true. Dale was one of the old guards. He raced in NASCAR back before multi-car teams and information sharing between teams was as common as it is today or as it was getting to in the 1990s. Mike Skinner was even quoted as saying that nobody raced him harder than Dale Earnhardt. There was no team orders and Dale was not going to move out of Mike's way, even if Mike was faster. Mike didn't exactly look like a rookie when he rolled up to Speed Weeks in 1997. He immediately won the pole for the Daytona 500 and backed it up by finishing second in his dual 125 qualifying race. Unfortunately, he was shuffled out immediately at the start of the Daytona 500 and failed to lead a lap despite starting from the pole position. He won the pole again at Daytona in the summer, but his rookie season really did leave a lot to be desired. He failed to qualify for the Fall Charlotte race and had just three top 10 finishes. But there was a bright spot in November of 1997. NASCAR headed back to Japan for its second exhibition race of the Suzuka circuit. Mike qualified fourth, led 26 laps, and won the race in dominating fashion, ending his 1997 season on a high note. And I totally forgot to mention, uh, Mike won Cup Series Rookie of the Year in 1997. At age 40. Age ain't nothing but a number, folks. But wait, 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 this is strange starters. So of course Mike didn't just run the Cup Series in 1997. He also returned to the Truck Series in 1997, running four races for Great Dane Racing. Dogs are cool, I guess. And uh, yeah, he earned uh, two top five finishes. Mike's 1998 season in Cup got off to a much better start. He earned eighth place finish in the Daytona 500 and had several strong qualifying runs early in the year but his season was derailed after a hard crash in the seventh race of the season at Texas. Uh, two laps down, but just outside the top 20. Wow, wow. apparently he had a tire let go. Something happened on the right front of that car and it just shot up in the floor. You can see how hard he hit. It really just bashed that right side, the right front in particular. Way hits it again. Mike still maintains that this is likely the hardest wreck he ever experiences and believes that it was a miracle that he survived. Injuries suffered in the wreck caused him to miss the next three races. 
He returned from injury to rebound with several strong runs over the summer and end his sophomore season with nine top 10 finishes and four top five finishes. He also won NASCAR's exhibition race at Twin Rig Motegi, giving him two wins in a cup car on Japanese soil, one on a road course and one on an oval. Mike also made a brief appearance as a truck series owner in 1998. He made two starts behind the wheel of his own number five truck, earning a top five finish at Fontana. 1999 was set to be a breakout year for Mike Skinner in the Cup Series. Mike would be paired with veteran crew chief Larry McReynolds for the full 1999 season. Larry had actually joined the team midway through 1998 and was partially responsible for Mike's strong runs the second half of the year. The pair made an immediate splash by winning the Bud Shootout qualifier and finishing fourth in the main event. They then got off to a hot start in the Daytona 500, leading 31 laps and finishing fourth. Skinner then knocked off consecutive top 10 finishes, making him the point leader after the first four races of the season. Things were then up and down over the next few races, and sitting at the mid-season mark, he was 11th in points, with four top five finishes and eight top 10s. In the second half of the year, Mike would capture the pole at Pocono and lead the most laps in the race, the first time he achieved this feat in his career. He led the most laps again at Martinsville in the fall and finished off the season with back-to-back -to -back top 10s at Homestead and Atlanta. He ended the year with five top fives, 14 top 10s, two poles, and a 10th place finish in the point standings. 1999 was by far his best year in Cup, and he was prepared to take that momentum into the year 2000. Strange starters though, so Mike was also racing in the NASCAR Busch Series in 1999. He made 13 starts for Team Yellow Racing and earned the only Busch Series win of his career at Atlanta. But it didn't come without controversy. Mike was awarded the win and then had the win taken away due to an apparent rules infraction. But later on that day, NASCAR rescinded the infraction and gave him the trophy back. The dawn of the new millennium marked the beginning of a new age for NASCAR, and Mike Skinner and the number 31 RCR team were ready to take it by storm. Unfortunately, they got started off a bit slow, with a best finish of just 16th in the first three races. At the fourth race in Atlanta, Skinner started fourth, worked his way to the front, and led 191 laps. He had the dominant car, and it looked like he was on his way to his first victory, but the engine let go while he was leading with 17 laps to go. And to pour salt in the wound, his teammate Dale Earnhardt won the race. Did we mention that they didn't really get along? Mike bounced back over the next few races with some decent runs and had a second place finish at Talladega. He won the pole for the following race at Fontana, and the number 31 team had some pretty strong runs over the summer months to help them climb to 11th in the standings by the August 5th race at Indianapolis. The rest of the summer and into the fall was pretty up and down, but Mike rounded out the year with strong runs in the final seven races of the season. He ended the season with one top five, 11 top tens, and a 12th place finish in the point standings. Of course, this wouldn't be strange starters if Mike didn't also do some Bush Series racing in 2000. He ran two races back with Team Yellow and six races with Andy Petrie's team, earning a pole at Dover and a best finish of third at Phoenix. Big changes were coming in 2001. Mike's crew chief Larry McReynolds left the 31 team to take an analyst position with Fox, and Royce McGee was brought in as his replacement. Now, things started off brilliantly at Speed Weeks. Mike won his dual 125 qualifying race and rolled off fourth for the Daytona 500. As per usual, the Rat Alliance cars were strong, and Mike ran up front most of the race. In fact, he led 24 laps. But on the final pit stop of the day, he broke a drive shaft while trying to pull out of his pit box, and the team finished 17 laps down in 26th position. Of course, this is the race that was also marred by the unfortunate death of Skinner's teammate, Dale Earnhardt. Mike later mentioned in an interview with Motorsport that 2001 was set to be a great year for him with RCR, as he and Earnhardt were finally seeing eye to eye and really starting to work well together. With as strong as the 31 team was in the 500 before they had their issues, that didn't really translate to the rest of the 2001 season. By the summer Daytona race mid-season, Mike had just four top 15 finishes and one top 10, and he'd led just 46 total laps. In the following race at Chicagoland, things completely derailed. While running fourth early in the race, Mike cut a front tire and made devastating contact with the outside wall. The NBC booth was audibly nervous with how hard the contact was. Come on, Mikey, get on out. 
That was a hard, hard lick. Just leave and cut right front. The car caught fire and Mike was unable to get out of the car under his own power as he was actually knocked unconscious during the crash. Safety crews came to his aid and he was transferred to a local hospital. His injuries caused him to miss the next four races and unbeknownst to him, it was the beginning of the end of his time with Richard Childress Racing. Robbie Gordon was tabbed to fill in for Mike. He'd had a very strong run at Sonoma a few races prior until some late race unpleasantness relegated him to a second place finish. We have a video on that, you should check it out. Robbie and the 31 team looked on their way to an easy win at Watkins Glen, but a fire with NPC's onboard telemetry system caused them to retire from the race. Mike returned to Michigan, but this lasted just five races before Robbie Gordon was given the seat to finish off the year. To add insult to injury, Robbie and the 31 team won the finale at New Hampshire, and Robbie was locked in as the permanent driver of the number 31 for 2002. Oh yeah, Mike did go bush racing in 2001 with RCR behind the wheel of their classic number 21 Rockwell Automation Chevy. Now that is a paint scheme. He made 14 starts, had six top fives, nine top tens, and a solid average finish of ninth. He actually qualified 10th or better for 13 of the 14 races. I kind of wish that Mike had done more Bush Series racing. He only ran 52 total races throughout his entire career. With the RCR ride behind him, in 2002, Mike signed with the legendary Morgan McClure Motorsports team to drive the number four Kodak Chevy. But this wasn't the Morgan McClure of the 90s. The team was on a decline and struggling to finish in the top 20. Mike's 2002 was very reflective of this. Despite a few strong qualifying runs, the team struggled to find pace and had reliability issues, including five motor failures. They had just one top 10 at Rockingham in the fall and ended the season with a 28th place average finish, and Mike was 31st in driver points. Mike returned to Morgan McClure in 2003 as the team transitioned from Chevy to Pontiac. Mike's 2003 run with the team was marred by a best finish of 11th and four DNFs due to crashes. After failing to qualify at Michigan in June, he was released by the team. But strange starters are never out of work for long. Mike jumped into Billy Ballou's number 15 truck and ran four races with the team, and he also drove Evidence Motorsports number seven Bush Series car at IRP to a seventh place finish. By the Brickyard 400 weekend, Mike was back in cup driving the number 01 US Army Pontiac for MB2 Motorsports, which had been shared by several drivers after Jerry Nadeau's career ending injury at Richmond. Mike ran 11 total races for the team and won the pole at Richmond before he was replaced by Joe Nemechek, who the team had signed for 2004. Mike then rounded out the season at Homestead behind the wheel of Michael Waltrip's number 00 Chevy. So Mike drove three different Cup Series cars in 2003. 2004 was the start of a new beginning for Mike Skinner, but was also kind of a return to his roots. He signed on to be part of Toyota's new venture in the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series as one of the drivers for the brand new BANG racing team. A team that was partly owned by his former Cup Series crew chief, Larry McReynolds. He drove the number 42 Toyota Tundra as a teammate to reigning series champion Travis Quapple. But strange starters never do just one thing. At the Daytona 500, Mike returned to Richard Childress Racing to drive the team's R&D car. The number 33 was sponsorship from Bass Pro Shops, and he finished 22nd. The truck season had its up and downs, and Mike led a lot of laps and he ran strong, but the finishes just weren't there. Mike's team was also having some internal issues. Due to unpaid bills and disagreements, Larry McReynolds decided to leave the team and Toyota ended their factory support, causing the number 42 team to shut down. Mike then jumped ship immediately to Bill Davis Racing and uh, yeah, he impressed right away by winning the pole at Las Vegas in his first race with the team. He finished out the year with the team and finished 12th in points, but more importantly, he found the team that he would spend the next several years with. In 2005, Mike went into full strange starter mode. He'd be full-time in the truck series with Bill Davis Racing, teamed up with crew chief Jeff Hensley. He was also set to drive six Cup Series races in the team's number 23 Dodge, beginning with the Daytona 500. He began speed weeks unsponsored, but midweek the team signed Argent Mortgage, and they wouldn't be disappointed as he finished third in his dual race, punching his ticket to the Daytona 500. He was unfortunately caught up in a wreck in the 500 and finished 30th. 
Mike also ran cup races for Mach 1 Inc. in a 00 Aaron's Dream Machine car, and he also ran for R&J Racing in their number 37 Dodge. This began Mike's time as a sought-after driver by small Cup Series teams that needed to qualify for races on speed. Mike was always fast in qualifying and could often outperform the equipment he was given. Back in the trucks, it looked like Mike was back to his mid-90s form. He won seven poles, led 800 laps, and had nine top five finishes, including back-to-back -back wins at Bristol and Richmond. He ended the season fifth in the championship. 2006 was another strong year for Mike in the truck series. He earned another eight pole positions, won the race at Las Vegas, and had 13 top tens. He ended up 10th in the standings, but 2006 was one of the strongest fields in truck series history. The top 10 were separated by just 447 points after Homestead. Now, of course, Mike didn't just run trucks in 2006. He made four starts in the Cup Series for three different small teams, including Front Row Motorsports. Yes, that Front Row Motorsports, back when they were at, kind of at the beginning of being a Cup team and struggling to make races. He also made the final Bush Series appearances of his career. He made nine starts behind the wheel of Fitz Bradshaw Racing's number 12 Dodge, earning a best finish of 10th at Charlotte in the fall. Heading into the 2007 season, Mike was 49 years old, and this is an age when most drivers have already hung it up or have at least seen their best days come and go. But not Mike. 2007 was set to be one of the best years since his Truck Series Championship in 1995. He returned to Bill Davis Racing and was once again paired with Crew Chief Jeff Hensley, and together, the duo were about to have a huge season. I'll give you a hint how it went. They had an average start of 2.5. I'm serious, 2.5. They won 11 poles, including a stretch of six straight, and their worst qualifying run was ninth. They led over 1,100 laps and won five races, including a season sweep of Martinsville. Heading into the finale at Homestead, Mike was leading the points by 28 over Ron Hornaday Jr. He had a very strong truck in the race and led early, but came down pit road as he thought he had a tire going down. Everything seemed to look fine, but a few laps later, Mike's entire left rear wheel came off the truck and the team could not get another tire threaded back onto the hub as it was heavily damaged. They had to go behind the wall to repair the truck and Mike's championship hopes were over. He missed out on the championship by just 54 points. They did everything right, but they just missed out on the title, and I'm still not over it. Strangely enough for our strange starter, he made just one Cup Series start in 2007 in three attempts. He drove BDR's number 36 Toyota to a 24th place finish at Texas in the fall, and this was likely due to his strong Truck Series season and really wanting to focus all of his attention on that effort, and it paid off. They almost won the championship. In 2008, Mike headed into what would be his final year in the Truck Series with Bill Davis Racing. He earned another four poles and a win at Las Vegas, finishing sixth in points. But the real story of Mike's 2008 is his time as Toyota Racing Development's super sub in the Cup Series. He returned to his role driving Bill Davis's R&D car, making one start at Las Vegas, in which he qualified a very strong fifth. At the next race at Atlanta, Mike was tabbed by Red Bull Racing to take over AJ Allmendinger's number 84 Toyota to help evaluate the team and help get them back in the top 35 in owner points. This was deathly important because back then, if you were in the top 35 in owner points, you were automatically locked into every race, but it was fluid. You could go into the top 35 and fall out depending on your finishes, and AJ was struggling to qualify for races because he couldn't fall back on his points if he wasn't fast enough in qualifying. Mike drove the next five races before Allmendinger returned at Talladega. And later that year, Mike was tabbed to fill in at Michael Waltrip Racing for a similar role. He drove the number 00 Toyota in three races to help evaluate that team and help get rookie driver Michael McDowell up to speed when he returned to the ride. Mike then returned to Red Bull's number 84 at Talladega and Charlotte in the fall after the team had released AJ Allmendinger, but before Scott Speed took over the ride at Martinsville. Now we mentioned earlier that 2008 was Mike's final year with Bill Davis Racing in the Truck Series, but it wasn't supposed to be. He had a deal signed through 2009, but the team shut down operations at the end of 2008. Mike signed on with Randy Moss Motorsports and took the number five with him. 
He and crew chief Eric Phillips hit it off, winning three races, earning 17 top 10 finishes, and they finished third in the final standings. And Skinner was still showing everyone at the age of 52 that he could compete for a championship. Our strange starter, of course, also raced in the Cup Series in 2009, but it was unfortunately as part of the all too popular start and park movement. If you're not familiar with it, there was a time in the mid to late in 2000s where several small teams would enter Cup Series races and would just park the car after a couple of laps. It got up to the point where there were seven or eight start and parks at each event. These teams would make absolute bank doing this too. They would only buy one set of tires. They didn't have to pay a pit crew. They would just go out, trim the car out, qualify and park the car after a couple of laps and claim something like a handling problem or a mechanical failure and collect their money and go home. Mike start and parked Tommy Baldwin's number 36 four times and TRG's number 70 once. In 2010, Mike returned to Randy Moss Motorsports, but the success of 2009 did not return with him. Crew chief Eric Phillips left the team and Gene Need was brought in to replace him. After 10 races, Need left the team and team manager Stacy Johnson replaced him as crew chief. Mike failed to win a race for the first time since 2004 and finished eighth in the championship. This would unfortunately be Mike's final full season in the NASCAR Truck Series, and it's not exactly the way that I wanted the inaugural series champion to go out. Without a solid ride for 2011, Mike became a strange starter for hire. He drove Eddie Sharp Racing's number 45 truck at Phoenix in the spring, and that would actually be his only Truck Series start of the year. In the Cup Series, he attempted nearly the entire season with four different teams. He drove two races for FAS Lane Racing at Phoenix and Las Vegas and had strong finishes of 24th and 29th when you consider the equipment the team had. He then went back on the start and park train with Jermaine Racing's number 60 Toyota in 15 races. He never completed more than 61 laps, but he did his job. He put a slow car in the show, parked it, and the team used the funds from that second car to fund their main car, the number 13. He returned to Tommy Baldwin Racing for one race at Atlanta and drove Larry Gunsplin's number 37 in three races, but he started and parked in all but one of them. We've now reached 2012, the final year of Mike Skinner's NASCAR career. He made his final truck series start in the season opening race at Daytona, but a crash ended his day early. In the Cup Series, he drove four races for three different teams, including one-offs in the 52 for Hamilton Means Racing and the 79 for Go Green Racing. He made his final two starts with Phil Parsons' number 98 Ford at Pocono in Michigan. All four of these races were unfortunately start in parks. In his final Cup Series race, Mike rolled off 43rd and parked the car after just 25 laps, finishing 39th. He was 54 years old. Now, at age 54, Mike felt like he still had fuel in the tank, but he decided to hang up his helmet due to concerns over concussions. In an interview with FrontStretch.com, Mike revealed that he struggled with concussions for many years, and he believes he had six or seven not minor concussions. His eyes were actually open to the idea of retirement after Dale Earnhardt Jr. took himself out of his car due to his struggles with concussions. Mike felt there was no point in risking further injury, driving slow cars for small teams at the back of the field. Since his retirement, Mike has made appearances at the Goodwood Festival of Speed in the UK, taking a NASCAR truck up the hill multiple times. Mike was also the test driver for the Amazon Prime show, The Grand Tour, where he was affectionately known as The American. So I've spent a bunch of time talking about Mike Skinner's career in NASCAR and you know, telling stories and rattling off a bunch of stats and whatnot, but what is Mike Skinner's legacy in NASCAR? Now, this is Strange Starters, so he definitely has a legacy as a strange starter. He drove for over a dozen team owners and was always a serviceable fill-in driver or a great driver to bring in to evaluate your team. He embraced the challenge of driving subpar cars for small teams, and he often outperformed the equipment that he was given to drive. So he hits all the strange starter points. But if you ask me for my opinion, I think Mike Skinner's legacy is very simple. He's the best NASCAR driver to never win a Cup Series points race. If you compare his career and his stats and his accolades to all the other drivers on the same list as him that have never won in Cup, he's the best of the bunch. He has a Truck Series championship and has 28 Truck Series victories, as well as one victory in the Bush Series. 
In Cup, he actually only ran all of the races in three seasons. And in two of those three seasons, he finished 12th or better in points. A lot of people sleep on Mike Skinner and they really only view him as a truck series success, but Mike was one hell of a driver in the Cup Series in what is arguably the sport's most competitive era. So let's all put some respect on Mike Skinner. A strange starter. Turn three. Gordon turns it up. Here he comes, cranking it up on the bottom. That Moving corner, closer, that corner. inching it up. Here Clear. they come for the finish. Adam Skinner Ford. stays in front. All right. <laughs> Get it. So thanks so much uh, for watching this episode of Strange Starters. Really sorry that it took so long between episodes. You know, I've been really busy going to races and doing my day job. So, you know, my apologies for that. But it's a lot of fun making these videos and I'm a big fan of Mike Skinner. Uh, you know, Mike won the pole for the first ever uh, truck race I went to, which was the Michigan race in 2006. And I've always followed Mike's career and done my research and looked back and watched a lot of races that he raced in. You know, like all you nerds, I'm sure you love watching old races too. So always been a big fan of Mike Skinner and it was a lot of fun making this episode. I tried to put some real insight into it and do some real research and not just, you know, read his Wikipedia page, you know, really try to bring you some different stories that maybe you haven't heard. And, you know, it was cool. And I, I do really believe that Mike is the best driver to never win in cup. You know, I think he holds that distinction and, you know, he even won two exhibition races in cup. So, you know, He's a great driver, you know, I'm a big fan of his, so thanks again so much for watching and let us know in the comments below who you think the next few Strange Stars should be. We have a list, but maybe there's some we haven't thought of, so let us know in the comments and be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Hit the notification bell so you can see whenever we post a video, which is weekly because we post the weekly Flashback to the Track podcast, which is partnered with our good friends at Blue Emu. They sponsor the podcast, which is fantastic. So we talk about all kinds of cool stuff, like we interview people, like Wally Dollenbach and Bill Lester. So go back and check out some of our old episodes. And we're also available on Spotify and Google Podcasts. You can download us and take us with you wherever you go. Thanks so much again for watching and thanks for listening to my rant at the end of this. Uh, really appreciate it and we'll see you in the next video. Bye.